What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on an important question, do you really need an SMSF? And to discuss this, we're joined by two financial advisors at Mansell Financial, Tristan Dallas and Georgia Ede, who have recently seen some unfortunate stories where investors may have not asked themselves this question before being convinced to start an SMSF. So welcome, Tristan and Georgia. Thanks, Daniel. And thanks, Peter. All right. So your investment philosophy, a book we wrote, shameless plug, available at Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say, our intent is educational, not rendering financial advice. Don't make a step to sign. These are simple concepts. We'd like investors to better understand risk so they can make informed decisions. Above all else, just remember this when you're considering an SMSF. You're basically on your own and no one is coming to save you if things are going south. You may not have access to any special compensation schemes. First, Tristan, and we'll get Georgia to follow up. So I was out having a Saturday morning walk and bumped into someone who I knew through a sporting organisation for many years ago. He knew what I did as a professional role, and we just started having a little bit of a conversation about that. And a couple of things that he raised with me really pricked up my ears. So I offered him the opportunity at some stage to come in and have a little bit of a chat. I also provided him with our book as well to give him a little bit of uh, a foundation of understanding. We met together uh, at our offices here and we started to unravel and unpack what had actually happened. And in terms of uh, a self-managed super fund, uh, he'd been pitched by uh, a trusted colleague in the, in the sporting group. And what did you find out when you got into there, Tristan? Well, sadly, we unpacked that uh, risk and return are certainly related. He was offered some very high uh, returns and it, there was a fair bit of income coming in initially. So the investment was working reasonably well. One of the flags he um, stated was that I'm just paying so much tax. And I thought that was kind of strange because I thought that there must have been some other opportunities, such as some franking credits to offset some of that tax. And then I'd also identified that uh, it actually met uh, preservation of age 65 and I, I queried him as to why they weren't in pension phase and thus not paying any tax. And basically he he conceded and his wife conceded that they had a, a, a lack of understanding. It was apathy and a lack of engagement. And also to their life and they had some other health issues that had actually got in the way of them really being fully engaged. And the flag was, of course, when they went to contact their accountant and their accountant's premises had closed the doors. Kristen, uh, I recall you giving me a bit more detail than you've just described about the sort of high returns that had been promised and in particular the returns they'd been promised on the safe part of the portfolio. Well, that's right, Peter. Even the actual product, I think, was called zero risk. So they were led to believe that uh, there was no risk actually at all. And it, like I say, it wasn't until I actually unpacked and I've you know, and, and from them reading the book as well, particularly on the, the risk and reward, uh, that identified that, yeah, okay, then we, we've sort of tapped out. We probably lost some dough here. And we had a look, look around inside some of these investments that were, that were placed inside the SMSF. They were all kind of related to each other in some way. And we actually found that one of them was actually registered at the business premises of the accountant. Now, the accountant wasn't actually on the, on the documents, but his business premises were. So you could start to see that all of these things were related in somehow. That's that's exactly right. That's that's one of the serious flags that goes up that uh, when the relationship is a little bit uh, conflicted and not illustrated to clients, then that's really uh, a sad uh, indictment on, I suppose, the delivery of why the self-managed super fund was really set up. They were just basically in an industry super fund before and there was no, no real need that they had to switch over to this that was um, suggested by their accountant, was it? That's right. I think they'd been sold trust. Uh, primarily, and then with the promise of higher returns without fully uh, understanding the, the associated risks. And if I can speak to that, over 44 years, I've watched so many instances in the past where investors want to believe that they've found the person that can deliver the no-risk, high-return investments. And unfortunately, this case is a good example of that. Uh, this couple who were not sophisticated investors, they trusted someone who didn't have their best interests at heart. Why? Because they wanted high returns and they thought they'd found someone that could deliver that with low risk. 
sector, I think that some of the self-managed super fund products are actually being pushed for those approaching retirement because for, say, myself and Georgia and Daniel, we've been fortunate to start day one in the workforce with super. Now, a lot of people approaching retirement have not had that opportunity. They've, a lot of them have missed out on, you know, 10 plus years of not building their wealth. So those formative years, they're trying to ramp up potentially the risk leading into retirement to end up with a bigger nest egg. That was one that was pushed on a couple by a trusted party being an accountant, suggested they set up the SMSF. What went into there was some fairly high risk investments, which are now under serious question. Um, ASIC is involved in that one. So over to you, Georgia, and you've got a, a different one where people have come to see you. They've been cold called and then they've set up an SMSF. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, so we had some pers prospective clients reach out to me recently. They explained that their situation was more of a cold calling example. So the wife had received a call offering to give them a superannuation health check um, they decided, yep, what a great idea, we'll go ahead with that. As a result, they were convinced that an SMSF would be the best opportunity for them. They went ahead and set up the SMSF, which only had one property fund inside it, um, and there was actually a link between the company setting up the SMSF and the funds recommended inside the self-managed super fund. From here, the fund has since actually gone into liquidation, which means their funds have been, been frozen. The clients actually can't sell down their investment and withdraw any funds. It's being investi investigated by ASIC at the moment, so hopefully there will be some relief for them eventually, but not can't be sure. There's an interesting angle to that. If the party that convinced them to set up the SMSF is actually not a, a licensed AFSL and the party that actually gave the advice to convince them to set up the SMSF, which by law is actually a financial product. If that person's not on the financial advisor register, um, then sadly ASIC might pursue uh, the bad actors, but there'll be no compensation scheme of last resort. There'll be no PI insurance uh, there'll be no AFCA claim to pursue. Uh, there's a high probability uh, that those people will literally be stranded with their nest egg decimated. I think they've found that the director of the financial advice business was actually a listed authorised representative on the FAR. What a, that's a really positive uh, potential outcome. Uh, he's, he's hoping that they've also got PI insurance that'll stand behind them and or, you know, the ability to claim via AFCA or the compensation scheme of last resort if all those other mechanisms don't deliver for them. But sure. what an awful position to be in to have to rely on those mechanisms in the first place. I saw one thing recently with the people who were involved in this, some of the advisors, they went off as authorised reps at this company and they've just started up a uh, a new advice business how would you even be able to trust like these people have been cold calling and now they've uh, gone off uh, the register at, at this this place and they've gone and started their own somewhere well, else well and the cold calling alone is actually a breach of the anti-hawking provisions under the corporations act so uh, uh, someone who's a registered financial advisor on the financial advisor register, it's actually illegal to cold call people and offer them a financial product. Note the the commonality of these stories. In both cases, it, it, was, it was pushed. In one case, it was a cold call. Um, in the other case, it was a trusted party being an accountant, but the investors did not understand what they were investing in. With yours, Georgia, what, what was going on? Did they say anything about whether it was uh, pushed as a the returns? I think it was it was returns and guarantee related um, because yeah. it was mostly property development and they would they were assuring them that you know property was the way to go. They could not identify there were related parties involved because in both both of these cases, the people who were pushing the SMSF also had a stake in the investments that were going in, or it very much looked like they had a stake in the investments that were going into the SMSFs. And if you don't have the ability to identify this, you shouldn't be you shouldn't have any business putting these things in your SMS or even having an SMSF because anyone who could identify this would know to avoid it. Quite often, you'll you'll find some of these SMS 
SMSF disasters will commonly have the person facilitating the SMSF setup also have their fingers in the pies of the investment that are going into the SMSF. Uh, so I guess back to the same question. Do you really need an SMSF? In most instances, probably not. The first thing every investor should ask themselves if they're considering one is, why am I doing this? Am I doing it because I'm being coerced? Am I doing it because I just so distrust professional money managers? Well, in the case of Tristan's client, they were in well-run, low-cost, industry super funds with good long-term records. It's pretty hard to justify that you can't trust the, the players that have been around for a very long time. Is it because it's your excitement, your ego to want to control your own investment? Well, you know, if it is, uh, maybe you should check that ego at the door. Make sure you understand why you're doing it and ask yourself the question, have I actually got the skills to do this myself? And if I have to rely on everyone else to do things, the answer is probably no. In, in the instance with you, Georgia, those investors, where was their uh, superannuation money? Both of them held industry funds as well. Can you reveal anything around why they felt it was necessary to shift? They didn't delve too much into it, but I think they even had a little bit of doubt in their own minds because they actually kept their industry funds open, each of them. Um, they said for ongoing contributions and the insurance that they didn't want to lose. So they, they transferred the bulk of of their wealth into the self-managed super fund and kept the token amount in there for the insurance and ongoing contributions. Well, one of the things that that would do, Georgia, of course, is that it, it means that the advisor doesn't have a liability risk related to the loss of insurance. The, the continued payment of employer SGC contributions into the industry super fund meant that the, the mechanics of their payroll system, that hasn't been tampered with at all. It's just the SMSF uh, promoter getting access to the big block of money. When you look at that from the outside, that's like, that smells even worse, smells absolutely disastrous. Final point here is what is risk? It's the old Ken French line of the inability to meet your future spending and you can't spend what you've lost. So I guess we can now touch on like the justifiable cases for an SMSF. I've certainly seen some fantastic outcomes for people where they've operated successful businesses and used their superannuation assets to buy the premises from within which they operate. That's great on a number of angles. It provides security of tenure, which allows for the continued, you know, uninterrupted operation of the business, provided the rents are paid at, at a commercial rate. That's as good as putting more contributions into your super fund. So for a business owner, it could well be that their business is capable of funding maximum concessional contributions uh, but someone who maybe is making a late start to their super fund accumulations, as Tristan alluded to earlier, those members can benefit from significant rental income, which goes into the fund and is taxed concessionally. And you can say virtually the same things for a farm. Also too, Peter, it doesn't actually mean an SMSF for life. There are certain you know, timeframes where uh, an SMSF is actually no longer required and it's more beneficial to, say, move it to uh, another platform or an industry fund. Couldn't agree more. There's many, many instances that I've observed over the years, people getting into their 70s and into their 80s and asking themselves the question, do I really need this SMSF? I've sold the business premises, don't have them anymore. Why do I need this complexity? And particularly as people head into their advanced years, they look for more and more simplicity. It's residential property. It's okay in some circumstances, but eventually you're going to have to meet your pension payments. Uh, most retirees, the vast majority of Aussies take their super at retirement in the form of account-based pensions. Once you've hit 65, the, the minimum drawing rate is 5%, and then it moves to 6, and then to 7, and then to 8, 9. The average return on residential property from a rental perspective is 5% per annum before your holding costs. So the net rent is effectively around 3 to 3.5%. Three so if you haven't got plenty of liquidity in your fund when you start at retirement, you're going to need it at some point. Residential property almost certainly cannot successfully deliver an income stream from an SMSF in the long haul for a retiree. 
Just one thing to touch on, particularly with the residential property, okay, in some circumstances, just because it's worked for somebody else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So I did have a young client or prospective client that wanted to set up an SMSF because her auntie had done so um, successfully investing through property. And I just had to warn her because it's happened for your auntie doesn't mean it's going to happen for you, particularly with running costs and understanding what it actually entails to, to run an SMSF. Uh, for me, you've got to find out what the rules of engagement are before you hit the pitch. I've seen it with so many people uh, even in terms of being an executor. Uh, it's nice to be an executor noted on a will, but actually when you are the executor, the complexity that's actually revolved around that to fulfil that role. And I think so many people that start self-managed super funds like to get into it with a positive understanding that they believe they know what's going on. But as we know, a little bit of information is quite a dangerous thing at times. And then once they're in, I think they don't really know how they can actually unwind themselves from those responsibilities. 